thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is our very first um, event looking at the themes of HK's own equal movement, which is designed to create a louder culture of equality um, and intersect our business sectors and our sector specialities. This is the first collaboration between the sport and equal teams, and we want to explore in the hour we've got together how sport can be used as a, as a tool for equality. Our panellists will look at the question of gender parity in sport and how organisations looking to engage with sport must acknowledge the significance of female participation and excellence and its role in marketing. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Vicky Gosling, who used to run the Invictus Games and now runs GB Sport. Tom Vernon, who's the founder and CEO of Write Your Dream, which is an extraordinary organisation that has graduated over four, fifth, no, 40 students um, to use their footballing talents to secure scholarships in the United States. And we all know how incredibly valuable those are and has 30 graduates playing professionally across the US and European leagues, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, we've got Lizelli Stiletti, who's the founder of a brand purpose consultancy called In Her Corner. Um, she's head of brand and campaign marketing at VAHA, an emerging fitness and sports tech brand that helps um, people to lead fitter and healthier lifestyles. And Laura Luisi, who's VP of Rights Optimization and Partnerships at DAZN. Um, she's one of the minds behind the streaming services, recent groundbreaking acquisition of global rights to broadcast the next four seasons. Yes, you heard it right. Four seasons of the UEFA's Women's Champions League, which is incredibly exciting. So welcome all. Um, I'm Tanya Joseph. I lead H&K's corporate advisory practice, and um, I've been involved in sports for a long while. And uh, some people may know that I am the architect of the This Girl Can campaign. Um, we're going to crack on because we don't have much time. We've got just an hour. And so um, without further ado, I wanted to go to Vicky first. We've just a week to go before the Olympics. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging Olympics for many, many reasons. And there, there are many things that people are concerned about. But we really do need to celebrate the fact that there are going to be even more female Olympians than ever before. I mean, it's brilliant news for women's sport. But does it really mean that we've got gender equality at the Olympics and in sport in general? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Tanya. I mean, uh, from my experience, um, I know looking at the winter sports side of it, we are absolutely we've in the last couple of years, we've got more um, snow sport athletes on more podiums across more snow sport disciplines than ever in British history. And of those athletes, uh, you know, I would genuinely say that there's approximately 50 50 in terms of females uh, versus males and I and also when I look at the, um, the the potential that we've got for uh, Beijing um, it which is happening in February we've got the Olympics in February uh, next year and then we followed by the Paralympics in the March the quality of the talent we have and the female talent is inspirational and I think what's going to be really exciting is as that talent really comes, you know, to the fore and people, they become household names, it's going to really increase the funnel at the bottom for us and increase the strength and depth of the female cadre that are coming through because, you know, they will see these women and realise just how possible it is. So I'm excited that actually the wheels are turning and I feel within the snow sport specifically, um, there's, there is a, a really good gender diversity. So that you know, that's really, really great progress in snow sport. But I mean, Lizelli, do you think that we are seeing more? Is, is that a is that common? Are we seeing it throughout sports? And also what I'm really interested in is off the field of play. You know, once we get beyond the athletes, all the people that support those athletes, are we seeing, seeing gender equality, gender parity there? Yeah, so I think the short answer is no. <laughs> I commend Victoria and her team for the great effort they've made there, right? That doesn't happen by accident that you end up having that 50-50 representation and participation, particularly across all those wide groups, especially for a niche sport like snow sports, to be fair. Uh, when you look at other mainstream sports that are globally sort of understood and heard like football, you don't really have that, which is why 
the deal that Laura and the team at DAZN have done is so ground, groundbreaking and also the work that Tom's team do with Right to Dream with the way they try and recruit young girls, particularly from African countries to come in and play sport where the access to participation is just not there. And I think that's very much reflected in when you look off the fields to answer the second part of your question as to who's making those decisions, right? That create those opportunities to either drive the visibility commercially for women's sport, but also on the other level on coaching side, if you look at it across all those sports, we don't have really great representation of women. And so you then struggle to get through a lot of young girls from those early ages to the teenagers to then get them up to the elite level. So I would say we're doing well, but if you were to give us a grading, I guess, paper, probably around about the 50% mark on how well we're doing. I think there's some great organizations, but federations, uh, I think, have a long way to step up and brands as well and the same, by the same token. And Vicky, I think it's interesting that within your sport, you're seeing and the, the, the male to female athletes that, you know, are about the same, but actually we know in sports administration, that it's not and actually you you are a, a female CEO and there aren't that many of you in G, NGB land and I just wondered how your experience of, of entering the fray um, and given that you have actually seen actual fray um, I'd just be interested in what that experience was like. Yeah so that again is a really good question Tanya because I, you know having come from a military background where you know it's very male dominated into the sports world which is very male dominated um, taking on a GB Snow Sports, which again has been uh, led, I, I mean, I think it, it had been male leadership the entire period up until uh, I was the first female to come in and, and take that role on. Um, and it's interesting because I, it's the first time I probably noticed that um, I probably wasn't accepted straight away in, in terms of those who'd been in the sport, it was quite male dominated, wondering where's this woman coming from? She's got a military background. Yes, she's done the Invictus Games, but how is she, what's she going to bring to this? Because she's not even, you know, an ex-female um, skier. So, I mean, you could really feel it. So, and, uh, I, and I think from my perspective, it's really made me focus on ensuring actually that I am hopefully, uh, you know, leading by example and inspiring people to follow rather than requiring. And it, t it took actually delivering results to really start for people to start noticing the difference in how we were being slightly more innovative in, in the approach and not seeing it in the same way it had been seen before. Um, if I could do anything or change anything, there's where the work really needs to come. It's in the female coaching because in the leadership and in the executive team, we've got a great sort of uh, leveling of, of females now in our sports. I mean, great to see it in some of the others, but I think it's really important now to start really helping, um, you know, the female coaches come through. And one final point I'll just say on administration, when I, I tell you when I was absolutely shocked was when I went to the first International uh, Federation Congress, which is FIS, uh, so it's the equivalent of FIFA for, for snow sports. And I looked at the general council and the general council were, were, was effect, effectively made up of 15 men and a male president. And they'd never had a female on there. And when I suggested they brought a female in, they said that they would increase it from 15 to, to 18 and bring three ma female slots in rather than rotate them through. So, uh, you know, it's been quite an interesting experience, but the change is coming. So I'm, I'm positive about that. Um, and Tom, thinking about football, the FA has just announced its first female chair. Uh, for the first time in its 150 year history. Um, football is played by millions of women and it's, a, is the sport really changing for women? You know, there are loads and loads of professional teams, but we know that they don't have the same access as men do. They don't get the same facilities. They don't get the same coaches or nutritionists. You know, for me, it's a bit of a vicious circle, isn't it? If they, if they don't have access to those facilities, to those, that, that, that expertise, then, you know, their, their levels of, of play are, are not going to be able to compare with some of them, especially in football, with the male teams. And then they don't get the partnerships they want and they don't get the media exposure. And at some point, something's got to give. You know, what do you see uh, can change and, or has changed? Um, it's a huge question. I think that there's, there's um, you know, multiple points. If I could go back very quickly on a couple of things first. And Lizelli's uh, five out of ten um, analysis, I think, in the Western context, is probably fair enough. But I think if, if we're having a global conversation, uh, it is important to note that certainly uh, in Africa, we're probably still at a one, a one and a half out of ten. Um, I'm not Asia experienced, but um, 
I, 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 I hear, you know, hear things that we're in a very different place. So while I think Europe and the US is, is making some strides, I, I, I don't even see the green shoots in many parts of the world mm -hmm. in relation to either um, participation at athlete level or in representation level. And, and then I think that um, uh, fr from what Victoria was saying, this kind of leads in, in, into answering the question that um, I think that, that uh, football needs to ask itself whether it deserves the quality female leaders that are potentially um, available and should avoid the arrogance of assuming that they would want to come and work in the corrupt racist environment that men's football has created. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure that it's that in some ways it's actually the right question because if I was, we were talking just before about the importance of mentorship and I feel that if I was uh, mentoring a, a, a world-class emerging leader in a uh, female leader um, in, in business and industry and they discussed an opportunity within a professional men's football club and actually in m many of the professional women's football clubs that I would advise them to steer clear um, because you've got to have a chance of success in, you know, as, as, as we build our careers. So I think in that regard, you know, it is fantastic to see, uh, you know, Debbie Hewitt uh, as the chairman of, uh, of a chairperson of the FA. But I, uh, I also fear um, uh, within that archaic institution that has in very recent times been making statements or taking actions which are just frankly disgusting in relation to issues of gender and race um that whether it's a whether it's a um a trophy appointment which i desperately hope that it's not or whether it's actually set up for success is a major question that any woman looking to get into major sectors yeah. of, of, of sport should be considering so i think we need to avoid the sort of the arrogance in in that regard that the, the top women would want to come and work in in our pretty embarrassing sports at times of football. Um, and then, then um, uh, uh, beyond that, I think that, you know, questions of comparisons to the men's game in relation to pay or what it looks like are very, very dangerous because we, we, we risk trying to emulate the men's game. Um, and, and we can see where the men's game is at today and trying to emulate what that stands for will be the death of the women's game. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I think that when we ask questions of access and participation, those are very, very important questions to ask, but we should ask them purely within a women's game context and remove all reference, in my opinion, to um, pay comparisons, because I personally believe if you analyze Gen Z and Alpha generate uh, data in detail, you could make a case for how women could be earning more than men in football in in 20 years time from what, what our kids are looking for from a values proposition. And so unless women are willing to say that when they earn more than men, they're going to give some of their salary to the men, compensate, I think that we should uh, remove any comparison in, in that regard as well and just focus on building uh, a women's football game that, that is uh, an inspiration and, and a super exciting product to the world. Um, but none of that removes the fact that, you know, in Ghana, in Ghana we run the only residential girls' academy in, in Africa, in Scandinavia, in, in a couple of years with, to be honest, fairly minimal investment into our women's academy. We're regarded, you know, in two regions of the world as, as the benchmark of excellence. And we're doing what we can and we're pushing as hard as we can, but we're very far from excellence. And so much of it is so far behind. So the access point within football um, is that I think on I think if if we're to follow the scoring then we're we're at a, we're at a two two and a half in Europe and and we're at a, a zero point five in 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 Africa in terms of access so we've got a phenomenal way to go but if we set a course which is for what we want from the women's game with no or almost no consideration of the men's apart from what we can learn from the mistakes that they've made to make a better product, uh, then that's the, the North Star that we set for ourselves rather than kind of climbing a ladder equal to, to mm. the one in the men's game because it will take us to a place we don't want to be in. Yeah, and the very, you know, you make really good point because the very thing that makes the women's game so attractive, both as a player but also as a spectator, 
are the things that I hate about the men's game, you know. Um, and when I when I remember going to see the the women's FA Cup at Wembley the first time it was played there, taking my stepdaughter and being incredibly excited and saying, this is what football should be like, right? This is where they play, they don't moan, they don't argue with the ref, they the, the um, camaraderie, the values, these are brilliant. And these are the things that we should be emulating, you know, you know, football at its essence rather than some of the perversions that we see in, in the men's game. Um, what do you think, given what you do, and I know that, you know, you do an extraordinary job, but what do you think we should be doing and brands in particular thinking about, you know, the, the clients that we have in H and K and the brands that are that are listening to this, what do you think their roles are in enforcing change or not forcing might be too strong a words, but facilitating change, encouraging change, prompting change? I mean, we're in we're you know we're in the age of, uh, of 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 purpose being what brands are trying to set at the core, and you know we've suddenly started to get phone calls from all kinds of brands who've who've. Uh, um, you know, denounce themselves to now be purpose driven and would like to acquire the right to dream stamp for three years um, to check whether that actually drives, um, you know, further sales and, 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 and actual brand equity rather than real purpose. So I think if I think if brands want to if brands want to uh, impact the women's game, then they should place it as one of the core objectives of their business rather than an add-on sponsorship portfolio, which um, you know, which they can then analyze some data on and decide three years later whether it's moved moved sales or brand equity targets that they had. Um, and and you know, again, what we learned from Alpha and Gen Z data is that um, if you try to uh, if you try to jump on something in the short term to slap a bit of purpose across your organization, the kids will sniff it out within within a little while, and you'll get no traction. So. If you want to, yeah. if you want to um, uh, be part of the women's game, then get your shareholders to agree that it is an objective of the company to improve and develop the women's game alongside the profit targets that that you have as an organisation. I think anything less than that won't won't really give you the skin in the game or the full commitment to to, to trying to bring about some change. But what I would say is that. Uh, in my view, if we if we set the right direction for women's football, um, the the return on investment um, and and not purely from a financial perspective, but from a financial perspective as well, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, opportunity in 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 global sport today. So coming to you, Laura, you've just um, signed a deal for five years for a five year sponsorship deal. What, what was your thinking behind that? And, you know, is this a signal of long term commitment to the, the kind of long term commitment that Tom was talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So for those that don't know the deal, um, DAZN have just um, signed a deal with UEFA to become the new global home of the UEFA Women's Champions League for the next four years. And as part of that deal, DAZN have also chosen to make um, for the first two years in particular, every single match available for free on our YouTube channel. Um, and I think, you know, riffing on what everyone has said you know one of the things we looked at was you know we want to make these players household names and we want to inspire the next generation of fans and players so we really thought long and hard about how we could do this i think broadcasters have a huge responsibility in driving growth for women's sport and um, ultimately you know it's broadcasters who choose what content is seen how it's shown and that directly impacts its fan bases um we looked at women's champions league and this is the the world's best football club competition. Um, it has everything it needs for success. It's skillful. It's got some of the world's best players like Ballon d'Or winners and Olympic gold medalists. And it's got some of the best teams. But there's a right now, like you sit around the dinner table and, and people aren't talking about it. So, you know, this should be making global headlines. It should have a global fan base. The stadium should be full. Um, so we looked at the reasons why, why, why it isn't getting the exposure it needs. And we really saw two things um, that we could do as the zone to unlock that growth. One is making it as easy as possible for people to watch. Um, that's ease of access and ease of following and, and also visibility. Um, and obviously the YouTube component of this deal achieves the visibility. What we didn't want to do was buy these rights and then put them behind a paywall on the zone because that isn't the right thing at this growth moment for the Women's Champions League. And it's not the right thing in this growth moment for, for women's football. Um, 
So as I say, there's a single global home, no matter where you are in the world, you know where you can watch it. And that is either as a DAZN subscriber on DAZN's platform, but if you're not, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, and as I say, we are looking to, to that ease plus visibility. Um, we, we believe it's going to deliver more rise and more audience. Um, but we also couldn't have done it without UEFA doing the hard work of centralising the rights, because without that, there's no season long story that can be told. And it's really difficult for the fans to follow. Um, the other thing that we obviously we are also doing, which again, you know, shows the, the the sort of responsibility of broadcasters, is we're also going to be investing in content. We need to make sure that fans have a reason to tune in and watch. You can't just put it on. You can't just make the live games available. You have to find a way to show people why they should be following this competition. We want to turn players into household names. We want to take fans closer to the players, and we want to really connect them with the competition. So we're going to be investing a lot in new formats, whether that be you know, fan culture or grassroots or lifestyle, various different types of content that we believe is going to um, reach new audiences. And we sort of see this very much as a snowball effect. Um, and I don't know if you, you, you saw our campaign video when we launched, but we have this campaign video called We All Rise With More Eyes. And we really believe in this idea of a snowball effect. So the zone, obviously, we're making every match available live. We're investing in production, which is going to lead to more audience, more engagement and more fans, which is then going to lead to more tickets being sold, more sponsors coming on board, more advertisers and ultimately a better commercial return for footballers and and the women's game itself. So obviously, as I say, broadcasters have a key role in this and DAZN are very confident that, you know, we have delivered the right strategy for the where, where the Women's Champions League is. And, you know, we can't wait to get going and really supercharge the growth of the competition. And we, we genuinely believe it will sort of ripple beyond the Women's Champions League. And this is something that's going to elevate women's football as a whole. And I think, you know, I think riffing on what everyone said earlier, you know, without having these role models, without seeing people achieve these things, the, the next generation of players and fans is not going to come through. So we believe we've got a, a real responsibility to to showcase what is possible um, in women's football. And, and hopefully, you know, there'll be more girls and, and boys that want to play football because of it. I should say that if people who are watching have got questions, please put them in the Q&A chat and we'll, we'll come to them later. But um, Liz Ellie, I'm really interested in this in the role of brands in in this space and you know Tom is absolutely right we don't just want the people who want to slap on a logo do us a, a deal for a season or so see how it goes have we you know have we sold more product off the back of it these are um these are growing they're still in evolutionary stages do you think there are enough brands out there who recognize that actually going in early um is a is a real advantage to sh to shape something and have a proper long term relationship with a sport, with a group of athletes, with a team, you know, whatever that format is. Yeah, no, I I, I don't think there's enough of them. I think there's some brands recently who have sort of let's say woken up to that opportunity and seen ways in which they can do it. Um, and I think let's talk about them in two camps. There's the ones that are definitely 100% to Tom's point rooted to it as part of their business's uh, kind of main core objectives and operations. So a business in that regard being Athleta. Athleta have obviously made a really great play for acquiring a lot of Nike's uh, hallmark athletes the likes of Simone Biles and Alison Felix, because they've said, you don't just come and represent us by wearing our apparel, we're actually going to help solve inherent issues that stop participation of women who look like you being able to progress in this sport and be successful, not just if they are Olympic standard, as those two phenomenal female athletes are, but also if they want to just play for health or social uh, sort of progression and also for community. And then you have the other ones on the other side of the camp, that are doing it kind of, let's say, hedging their bets and hoping that it'll work well by going in with youth programs, but very much again with a focus on men's football as opposed to football as a whole. And that's like New Balance. New Balance have done a great job of acquiring a lot of talent, particularly young uh, footballers in, in the UK and are looking to grow them. But I would actually argue, wouldn't that have been a great opportunity for a brand like New Balance, which is meant to be a challenger to the Nikes and the Adidas and the Pumas of the world to have actually gone and done something much more rooted in thinking about the women's game. And, and I, I'll borrow a phrase from a guest of mine who was on the podcast, uh, Beck Smith, really great form international player, talks about how we need to start thinking and brands need to start thinking about football and generally women's sport as a startup business and to treat it in its own entities and to think about the ways in which levers that those businesses are really successful at pulling 
can actually help to grow the game. And also thinking about how do you invite women to actually come in and co-create them? I'll, I hope Laura doesn't mind me saying, but I would really bet all my life savings to say that the zone would not have been able to do the deal that they did had they not had someone like a senior figure in Laura and the business being female and driving that forward and pushing it forward, working with the rights holder, working with a great media partner, that wouldn't have happened. I'd also hazard to go and say Vicky, being a CEO of, <laughs> of Snow Sports TV, probably again, they wouldn't have that great gender parity there because again, they wouldn't be somebody sitting in that business 100% vested in that and also pulling brands in and making those prerequisites of how they engage and do business. So I would say brands need to kind of ask themselves a little bit about saying, why do we exist? And what are the things that we currently have in our gift that can actually help drive on that sport? And in particular, how women's sport not just only happens on the pitch, but also what are we doing that's creating sense of belonging and a sense of actual success for the women who do want to come into our organization. I know Tom's telling them not to, but <laughs> the ones who do want to come on in and help make changes. What can we do for creating success and the tools for them? And I think another one, and I'm just going to say it, is that. Brands also need to look at saying, how do we increase participation, particularly in women's football, which is the global game for black women and brown women? Because I think that's something that doesn't get talked about. Whilst we might be making great strides and getting 50-50 in some sports, those are predominantly white women, right? Those are not girls and women who don't come from non-white backgrounds. And I think, again, that's a really great space a brand can own and play in, particularly brands that already have a great affinity to those black and brown communities, is to ask themselves, what more could we be doing with our platform to remove whatever barriers that they are for them feeling a sense of belonging? And unfortunately, the recent fallout from the tournament and the Euros final showed us that there is still a lack of space even in the men's game for black and brown people feeling like they belong and are judged on equal merits. So I would say that's my biggest plea to brands. Think about what do you have in your gift? What are your areas of influence? And how can you serve better those audiences that are largely underrepresented in the game? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, when Tom started talking about how do we really need, are good women really going to join it? I, I reflected and thought, you know what, I remember enough, um, not that long ago, someone asked me to recommend people for a role, in a senior role in football administration. And I was thinking, there is no one I know that I would recommend for that role because do they want, you know, do you want to be part of that? Um, and that the point, it's one of the questions that's come up in the, in, uh, from our audience is around gender equality. Um, can we say it's gender equality when only white women are having the 50 50 spread? And I think that that's a, a point you've made very eloquently there, uh, um, Yuseli. Um, We've got a couple of other questions and one and, and actually they speak to some of the things that Laura was talking about in that, you know, the 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 role that you're doing and not just um um broadcasting the games, but actually creating content to tell stories. Um I've always thought about all sport actually. One of the you know, one of the reasons why um commercial sport has been, is so popular is because we tell stories about the players. It's not just a match report, right? We we care about the individuals whether it's the team or the actual players, we care about them. You know, tennis has done it really, really well. We care about those players. Um, you know, and I think the balance between intruding in people's private lives and telling the stories is, is, is a delicate one. But, you know, we care about them. We care about, I care about the play, people that play for my football team. Um, sometimes I wonder, wonder why, because they don't reward me. Um, but, you know, so one of the questions we've got from Crystal Island is great to hear all the speakers on the topics about women's football. Do the panel have any thoughts or ideas as to how industry can collaborate better on storytelling of female participants and coaches in order to inspire more women joining teams? Um, I just wondered if any of you. Vicky, do you want to jump in here? Well, my experience of this was really interesting. When we tra when we triggered the, uh, and we, we started off with the Invictus brand, and I loved Lizelli talking about treat it like a startup. Invictus was a startup. It was a brand that, you know, nobody knew. And we kind of started it from nothing. It was using the power of sport to inspire, you know, to basically promote recovery. And um, and we got the uh, we got the BBC to to get behind it and tell a documentary of the stories of the lives of these individuals who are inspirational characters. You know, double amputee who got blown up in 2011 and went on to 
actually uh, win a bronze medal in the Paralympics you know, in 2016. We told the individual stories and honestly, the, that brand, if you think about it, it when it, we, we kicked it off in 2014, by the time we, you know, five years later, everybody knew about the Invictus brand and it was down to the really powerful storytelling. But it was, it was, it was brands like Jaguar Land Rover and Sage that got behind it and shared the stories as well and activated for it. And I think that there is a real lesson to be learned with how we did Invictus and what can be done for female sport here, because there is no doubt in my mind when I look at some of the athletes that I have the privilege to work with and I see, you know, a young Mia Brooks who's, you know, well, 13, 14, and what she can achieve or Kirsty Moore, who's shy as anything, but incredibly talented. And then you tell the stories that where they've come from and and, and what they've done to, to achieve this, it's so powerful. And brands can definitely help with that activation and telling those stories and getting this uh, the, the game grown um, and increasing uh, the opportunity for women, no doubt. And did you see that, that that storytelling not just brought, um, raised awareness of the brand of the Invictus Games, but did you, was there any evidence that um, showing what, uh, showing, showcasing the athletes encouraged oh. more disabled people to be active? Tanya, it was massive in the fact that not only did it showcase, um, you know, it, it, it showcased the in, what the individuals could achieve and, and effectively for disability, but not just for disability, for just people who are struggling with mental health and actually struggling to be motivated. You watch, if you watch a triple amputee swimming 100 metres, it's pretty inspiring, you know, and people have, you saw this rather be people thinking, right, I need to actually do more. I need to get off in my bum and actually start being active. So I've got no excuse. I'm completely equipped with all my limbs. But for disability sport and for the Paralympics, um, I think it was huge as well, because it gave those people who did have disability or who had really, you know, sort of uh, difficult mental health issues, it gave them the inspiration that it was achievable. And actually, even though they were really struggling with some of the worst conditions, seeing these other individuals who are probably some of them worse off and having their story told and shown what they'd achieved, it made it so much easier for the individual sitting there who's also disabled to believe that they had a hope. And you saw it with kids. We saw a lot of kids with amputation coming forward and their parents bringing them forward and saying, how can we get my child involved in this? Because if that's what they can do, then I'm more, I've got more belief than these guys can do it too. And I do think it's really similar for females. And you you know, for me, when I look at, I did a, um, a a good example is we did something called Project Balance in Westminster for, for the Westminster Academy, actually. And, and it was at and it, with the state school there. And we had 15 girls and 15 boys, all from really diverse backgrounds, because we want to increase the diversity and get some some kids, as Lizelli, get some girls, you know, black and, and, and people of colour onto the podium so that they can inspire the, you know, but give them the opportunity in the first place to really make it happen. And we did this, uh, this skateboarding, we gave them like uh, 30 hours of skateboarding lessons. And honestly, it's been phenomenal. And if you start telling some of the stories of the kids, like the girls that attended, and they'd never been on a skateboard in their lives. And by the time they got to the end of the skate, and they were really intimidated, but by the time we got to the end of the skateboarding course, in fact, we took them into the snow dome yesterday, they were on fire. And it was, it just showed you that you just kind of need to, to help take down the barriers by showing it's possible. And then people will then be more motivated to take part and get involved and support in whichever, whether it's coaching, whether it's taking part, whether it's becoming a pro athlete, um, you know, or administrator. I think it's really important to be able to showcase it. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that we found when we were doing This Girl Can is that whilst people found our female Olympians in particular absolutely inspiring and we cheered for them, and we wanted them to work, do well, when Jessica Ennis Hill comes back having just had a baby and is, you know, phenomenal, we are jumping on our sofas and doing really, but it doesn't make me think I can do that. We think, isn't she extraordinary? So finding role models who, it makes me think I want to buy tickets to see her because she's amazing. And I, you know, and, and then I'm interested in athletics, but do I want to do it? Probably not. But you know, so finding women that look, that feel a bit more like me yeah. um, exactly. is, might be the thing. And again, Tom, I'd be really interested to see how this plays out in the kind of areas that you're you're operating in, um, because I think that it's it's 
who are the who are those role models that are going to really say to to the, the the girls that you're talking to you can do that that's something that's yeah. a space that you can be in i think um it, again i i don't want to go on about comparing to the men's game but when i one of my questions is is like how brave can we be in in how we define what um uh building a sports team might look like so we're we're launching a professional women's team in 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 Egypt next year alongside our team that we have in in Denmark and so some of the questions that we're asking ourselves because all of our women will be fantastic players is how could we assemble the teams to drive narratives and um sort of fairly inevitable outcomes of Scandinavian women playing in the Egyptian league for a year or Egyptian women playing in the Scandinavian league for the year. And and I want to stay very far away from the idea that this is kind of curating reality TV. But when, when we think about um, what our teams could look like, if we have a pool of excellence, can we build conversations and can we build connections between teammates that are based not just on whether this is the best possible player we can afford in this position, which is which is how the men's game looks at it, but to say what what would happen if if three super talented Scandinavian elite footballers went to play in the Egyptian league in the year, and what would the storytelling platform be that we create around um, you know very well documented conversations about how. Uh, the, the limitations on Muslim women's access to uh, to playing sport, and then vice versa. If we took our Egyptian women to play within our in our um, uh, in, in in Scandinavia, and, and we plan to replicate that kind of concept around the world at academy and, and pro level. So I think that um, again, rather than looking at like what are the standard revenue drivers of the men's game, you know, for example, transfer fees um, is kind of an immoral construct anyway. So we might not want to get there. And so if we said that we took a slightly broader perspective to how we assembled a team, you know, in Denmark, we have Nadia Nadim, who it was great to see made it on some of the the, um, the TV in, 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 in the UK for the Euros. I mean, the story is off, off the charts. And, and one thing is to tell the story. But another thing is then can we kind of track and engage with those learnings and pass those learnings down to um, and not just our young girls, because my i have three boys only one likes football but he's a big fan of women's football after the 2019 world cup and comparing that to going to the euros for the men's and all the hostility but um can we can we curate these experiences and kind of dare to look at our teams as um media products but not telling kind of um soap opera stories but starting real conversations that are baked into the construct of what our teams stand for. And so I think we need to be a bit braver in how we imagine the future of women's football and, and, and what a sports director's role is and how that is integrated within the commercial department because it's, um, again, men's football is no, no example for us to look at that. And I think, I think this, this, you know, it is really groundbreaking what's, what's happening now with the zone and women's champions league. And I think if, if, the, the, the team owners of which I'm one, and we hope to play in the champion women's Champions League in Europe as well as Africa. I think there's a different mindset which is more aligned to U.S. sport, where all the owners collaborate to say how do we build our product. Whereas in men's football, we're all trying to screw each other every day on everything. Um, and so I think that collective mindset towards um, uh, uh, towards building a, a different product could be could be a really good way forward. Um, so we've got a question from Josie Stevens, who I need to carry in. So Josie and I used to work together. She is a former H and Care as well, uh, but she worked, She and I worked together on this girl can, and she knows a, she knows a lot about uh, women's sport. So I'm going to take a question. Um, really good discussion um, on and particularly off the field. Sport can feel like a monoculture, a space wholly occupied by a select few. What are you, your organisations, actively doing to create a culture that is actively welcoming to all, particularly women? I don't know who wants to pick that one up first. Oh, I'll go ahead. <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, uh, you a moment, I, the rest of you a moment to work it out. 
<laughs> I think probably I'm in the luckiest position. That's why I volunteered. So it's an easy one. I, I set up in her corner primarily to tell stories about women and their stories uh, in terms of the career journey they've had into getting into sport and the lessons that they've learned. And I did that deliberately because I'm linked to a network of schools and colleges for girls who are thinking about where they want to go to next. And I was really conscious after being connected with those um, schools and particularly colleges, finishing colleges, that these girls did not ever think about the sports industry as somewhere they would go to for the reason that Josie's asked her question. They could never see anybody who looked like them or that the space would be welcoming to them if they did dared to come into it the way I had. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was make it really clear for them to be able to see somebody tangible and relatable to your point about that this girl can to say that they'd see the amazing Serena's, the Jess Garnises, they'd see the Gabby Logan's, etc. And they would then still say, well, I'm not quite sure I can fill those spaces. What are the other things I can do? So the deliberate constructive in her corner's DNA, if you like, is to make sure we tell all stories, no matter what level, and to give women ways in to be able to then after those stories are told, all the women that appear on the podcast, which is a real gift and blessing, they all agree to then mentor anybody who comes in and asks for support. And it's been really great to see it grow in the last 12 months. And it just, again, shows you that if little old me can do that, back to my point about what is in the gift of brands who have much better systems, really great career opportunities to be able to reach out and do the same and make it really able for those women to stand strong in the individuality because I think there's not enough of that if, if I'm honest and that is part of let's say it was a provocation to get people to start thinking about that and one of the nice things that has happened as well off the back of that is I'm currently working with a brand that don't yet want me to name them but they're quite a good um, kind of well-known global brand to make a mentoring scheme where they'll commit to fund places for women to go into organizations and be able to have progression pathways. And that's something I feel super passionate about because it's great to tell the stories, it's great to showcase the role models, but unless we create the deliberate opportunities to go and challenge those monocultures that Josie's talking about, to show that there is a different way and it is a better way in order to change even the cultural mindset of organizations. I think there's a lot to say positively about organizations that do have that balance and allow women to come in and own the spaces. So those are the things that I'm doing personally, uh, and I'm pleased to hear that brands are happy to let me have the opportunity to take it further. Laura, Thank you look like you want to come in. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I think, so from my perspective, I think, you know, Liz Ellie articulated this, this pretty well. I mean, obviously, diversity across the spectrum of a business, but particularly at a sports broadcaster is really important because every day people have these 50-50 calls to make. Should I show this game? Should I show this game? Should I put this player on a marketing asset or should I choose this player? And I think when you don't have a diverse team that are making those day to day calls, um, you, like people, people can either not see that what they're doing isn't inclusive or they can, you know, follow their biases or whatever it might be. And then when you obviously get to a leadership level, you know, in, in decision making again, you know, something like the Women's Champions League deal, you know, perhaps if. Um, there, there weren't women that were involved in that or people that supported this and could see the bigger picture and could see that actually if we build the right strategy, it can be something that is, is it that can deliver a commercial return. We perhaps wouldn't have had the deal either. So I think for me on a personal level, you know, I look every day at how I can think more broadly and, and try and make sure that what I'm doing is inclusive. I think as a business, we are very much on a journey. Um, I think sports media in the UK is historically white and male and not only white and male, but also white male and private school, um, which has its own challenges. Um, obviously, I, I'm, I'm a female. I am mixed race. I do not come from that background. So it's been challenging for me to find a way to say we are on a journey. And I think one of the things we are really trying as a business is for every department to really own its own commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion because it shouldn't be top down and it shouldn't be bottom up. It should be actually everybody taking responsibility. So each team looking at their area of responsibility and saying, what can I do? What can we do to make sure that we are challenging the status quo and making sure that actually we are we are representing um, things in a diverse way? Because you know we are a direct consumer business. Our customers are those groups that perhaps feel excluded from a lot of forms of society. And we need to make sure we're representing them. So. We don't have an answer. We're on the journey. Um, 
I think we all, you know, as individuals, I think we, we have a responsibility to do everything we can to call things out, to challenge things. Um, and as, as organisations, I think each team has to really look at what they can control and where they can make a change. And Vicky, shall I'm going to come to you yeah. before I get to Tom? I think from um, from my perspective, it's really important in our organisation to I'm looking at every every level, as Laura po points out, to have a look at you know how are we inc increasing the quality and diversity of the teams anyway. But female coaches has been a key one where I've sort of positively looked to seek out female coaches and put them on a journey where we can really nurture them and give them the, the opportunity to thrive. So they're creating a great role model. And we've done that in ice skiing, we're doing it in snowboarding, but also it's um we just brought in um in a life a performance lifestyle advisor who I was absolutely I mean she was by far the best out of all the applicants, but you know it's great because and um, she's coming in and and she's you know she's literally uh, going to set the example and and she's first time with the athletes and she's fantastic but it's a great career path as well from from her background that she can show the way so we're trying to bring in people at every level bringing in women from diverse backgrounds who can really role model for us at, at every level and the more we can do that the better but also this participation piece Tanya I think going into some of the inner city um schools and giving you know the, the girls the opportunity to do the skateboarding transferring them into the snow sport world is is great because it then just increases um again the opportunity for all these individuals and then they think well actually it is definitely possible because you're paving the way taking down the barriers and hopefully that way by increasing the funnel here we'll get more onto the podiums more girls onto the podiums from different backgrounds that you know can just be the role model for example um for yourself you know you do want to have uh you know different different kids there that people can look at other kids can look at and think oh my gosh she's got a similar background from me she's actually come from from here and look where she is now that's amazing how did she get there and then follow the path it's easier to see if you can't see it it's really difficult to to be it so that's what we're trying to do in, a, in every level, whether it's through the administration or coaching or whether it's actually at increasing the participation itself and the role models that we've got within the organisation. Um, and Tom, and I'm going to ask you to, to I'm going to fold in a question that's been asked, which is around, which I think is. I'm just going to ask it right. Um, around you being in Africa as a white, I'm directly quoting you being in Africa as a white man, and how do you ensure that uh, Right to Dream isn't, doesn't just come across as just another form of colonialism? Because I think that, you know, that's an aspect worth addressing. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, one of my good friends uh, says that Africanism is by contribution, and um, that's certainly one of the ways that I um, like to look at it in in the obvious internal wrestle that you outline in that in in that question and and how we're perceived. Um, and so I, I moved there as a 19 year old, and uh, Ghana gave me everything that I have today uh, from the values that I've learned and the culture that I live. And one of the things that, uh, if not the thing that I'm most proud out about uh, with Right to Dream, is that. I now uh, believe that we are a Ghanaian export brand, and what we export is Ghanaian values, and that you know led to Right to Dream being the first African youth academy to purchase a professional football team in Europe, and to to implement principles um, like it takes a village to raise a child, which is the fundamental element of our Ghanaian academy within a Scandinavian context, or to take principles like Ubuntu that I learned in Africa and to place them at the core of our expan expansion strategies. So um, uh, I, I certainly went through a process of unlearning because I am very obviously a white middle-aged middle-class British guy and as a result when I reflect on my education and feel uh, a great deal of embarrassment and shame at the narrative that I was taught as a young kid growing up in the UK um, I, I didn't uh, didn't get on a plane to Ghana as an enlightened guy who knew it. I got on a plane to Ghana as a guy who thought he knew better. Um, but luckily, the experiences that my life opened me up to, um, first of all, humbled me. Uh, and then secondly, after my unlearning, kind of took me through a relearning process of the fact that um, uh, while I, you know, I've, I think, made it clear that I believe there's a huge amount that can be learned from the women's game, 
um, the amount that the world today could learn from African culture that it's trampled on for 500 years and now can't find routes to happiness and um, and cohesion in America or, or, or in the UK. Um, you know, to go back to the women's point, I do believe that if, if women had explored the world in the 16th century, they would have gone to Africa and, and taken a whole different set of things out of the continent that they would have brought back to Europe to uh, improve their countries rather than the way um, people who look like me behaved. So I think, you know, for me, there's, a, there's um, you know, obviously a, um, a, a an ongoing sort of uh, battle in sort of that narrative and how people perceive me, but I feel very comfortable in my own skin and the lessons that I've learned and the things that, that, that we stand for as an organization and that we now uh, try to take to the world um, through many phenomenal uh, Ghanaians who lead the organization, graduate from the organization and speak on behalf of the organization much, much more than I do and in a much more talented way because I was always pretty crap at football. Um, thank you for your uh, honesty there. I think one of the things for me that we need to recognise about privilege is that we, we all have some privilege. It's, all of us on this call have privilege, right? The most important thing is recognising it and then trying to do something positive with that privilege. Um, so, you know, thank you for what you're doing and for being honest and, and open about it. Um, we have five minutes before we have to close. So I'm going to ask you all one of my questions. Um, bearing in mind we only have five minutes. So what would be the one thing you would want to see to drive gender equality in sport? I'm going to start with you, Vicky. I just think it's it's creating the platform and I think Laura's doing a phenomenal job of that. Where we can see it more, where we can see more female sport um, and we can actually drive those stories and we can tell the stories and inspire the nation that way. For me, I think that's absolutely key. Um, Laura? Yeah, I would say for everyone individually to think about what they can do, whether that be, you know, the, the things that Lizelli was talking about around mentorship, how you as a person can drive to make the world a more equal place. What are you personally doing, whether it would be within your job or, or outside the industry? And then as an organisation, what can that organisation do based on what they can control? Because you know, everybody on this call can go out tomorrow and do something different, whether it be for themselves or actually in the role that they do in their job. So I think for individuals and organisations to look at what they can control and really make sure that they are driving that change forward. Tom? Um, I would like a consortium to purchase women's football from FIFA so that it doesn't um, replicate itself in, in uh, the men's uh, uh, iteration of the game. A female-led consortium of, uh, of, of people who can afford to do that. Let's have a side conversation about that because that's really interesting. And Lizelli. I think uh, I'll, I'll cheat and say everything that everyone has said, but I think more importantly as well, just asking yourself, what, why is it important to you to make that difference? Uh, I think being really honest and starting with your why can help anchor you because what we're asking for is very difficult. And I think if you're not really invested in it and you don't really have clarity on why you want to improve things, then you probably can't help to move things forward. So I think start off by asking yourself why and then what are those small everyday things you can do to Laura's point. And if you can introduce Tom to somebody who's really rich and can get that consortium out there and continue to help purchase rights to create those big platforms for great snow sports like Victoria and her team are building to get those night nice gender parity and get more different people playing sport, then yeah, please contact us. We want to talk to you and be your friend forever. <laughs> Um, thank you. That's been brilliant. My thing would be to think about what it is that stops women getting involved and taking part, whether it's every day just doing grassroots participation, just, you know, putting on a pair of trainers and getting on with it, or whether it's dreaming that they can be a, a full time or even semi professional athlete. You know what? And how can we as individuals and within our organisations and you know make those changes to help to help women do that because we all know that active women are healthier women are happier women and when we get happier and healthier women we have ha happier and healthier communities um 
So that's what I'd want to do. Um, I've loved doing this and I would like to carry on, but I'm, I'm getting little warning things saying you only have two minutes. Um, so thank you so much for being um, taking part today, for joining us, for our audience that have stuck with us. Um, thank you so much. It's been a really, really, really interesting conversation and I hope it will be the beginning of the, the first of many. So thanks very much. Thank you very much for having thanks us. Everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye. Bye.